but it has so been the stop the watching Fox or CNN or whatever you watch when they can fake you know, crazy people. Good afternoon. This is the Wednesday edition of TRD Talks Live. I'm Stuart Elliott, the editor-in-chief of The Real Deal. Uh, and today I'm sitting down with Peter Zalewski, the founder of Condo Vultures, to discuss the state of the South Florida real estate market uh, in these uncertain times. Uh, and to give a look ahead briefly, this Friday we've got senior managing editor Eric Inquist hosting a talk on New York real estate getting back to business. He's going to be sitting down with Kathy Wild, president of Partnership for NYC, and Andrew Kimball, CEO of Industry City. Uh, and also... If you're not a subscriber to The Real Deal and you're watching this for free, please go to The Real Deal after this program and subscribe. If you believe in the unique value we bring to your inbox or desktop or laptop each day with our coverage, um, you know, you're supporting independent journalism and it's only 40 cents a day. Um, so you know, to introduce, um, most people in real estate talk up the market with hype and saying how great things are. Peter Zalewski, who I have here today, is the exact opposite. He's well known as a thorn in the side for many in South Florida real estate. And with his company, Condo Vultures, um, he consults on and brokers sales of distressed assets. Uh, initially, he's a journalist like by trade. Uh, he was very active during the Great Recession, which saw a lot of pain for Miami real estate. Many would argue that uh, the Miami of today is in a much better place. Um, and he was even portrayed as a capitalist in the Michael Moore documentary, Capitalism, A Love Story. Um, and full disclosure, he's also been a columnist for The Real Deal and Miami Herald in the past. So we're going to hear from him today about what he's seeing in South Florida real estate, where the opportunities are, and, and what it's like to be a real estate contrarian. Um, so welcome, Peter. How's it going, Stuart? Hey, welcome, Good. Miami. I went yes. off the grid after I stopped writing the column for The Real Deal back in April of 16. So I'm back, baby. I'm back. Yep. We, thought, we thought it was a good time to have you. We, where were you doing that, during, those, uh, during that time? Um, I spent two years traveling the world. I'd basically taken advantage of cheap airfares. I was going everywhere. had a backpack, India, Middle East, uh, all over Asia. And I figured I'd come back in 2018 to start rocking and rolling with a downturn. And lo and behold, Donald Trump's uh, pressure on the feds to cut interest rate and keep them low ended up extending it longer than I wanted to. But now I'm ready to rock and roll. Where was your favorite place during all those travels? Uh, I love Dubai. I figured out a hustle in Dubai where I would land in. I jump on the metro for like two bucks. I would stay in a place that was all expats and I was paying about 50 bucks a night for five star. So I'd always have a stopover in Dubai on my way somewhere else. And the airfare was like 700 bucks to Hong Kong or anywhere. And you got a couple days in Dubai. So that was, that was rock star. Nice. Maybe eventually there'll be a kind of vultures Dubai. <laughs> Um, so why don't you tell, this is a national audience as well as a South Florida one. What is it, kind of vultures, what does it do? Tell me a little bit about it. Yeah, so uh, back in the day, I got down to uh, South Florida back in, was it, 1993. So I've been through a few of these. I was a journalist a long time. The last gig was a banking uh, reporter. And um, when I was a banking reporter, I went to get and I put together a hit list for the last uh, go around in South Florida. Came up with a list of which lead lenders would have the most to lose if the market went to shit. And ultimately, it did go to shit. So right before it did, I set up a buy side brokerage relying on data. Today, they call it big data. We were basically calling uh, all the stats, put it together, create modeling buildings, modeling markets, and using the information against the developers on behalf of buyers to buy stuff at significant discounts. Uh, by the way, for the audience, there's a Q&A button at the bottom. If anybody has questions, we'll be monitoring that throughout. So, you know, many would argue, like I mentioned before, Miami is a stronger city than 10 years ago, but, you know, there's also a global pandemic and financial shockwaves that are unprecedented. So what's, you know, the one most concerning thing about the state of the market right now for you? Well, it's the typical Miami shtick where it's oversupplied. It's oversupplied in last cycle, the foreign national saved our, our ass, if you will. They came in, they had a strong currency against a weak dollar. They had cheap real estate prices. They were buying stuff and they could rent it dirt cheap. Problem is today under the current immigration climate, and I don't really care about politics. I only care about the greenback. Under the current uh, <coughs> climate for immigration, some people don't feel welcome. And therefore, they're sitting on the sidelines. So I don't know who the savior is who's going to come in and take down all of these oversupplied units. I mean, I was looking at some stats, just generally speaking. This includes the new and the old stuff. You got about nine months of supply in South Florida. Lion's share is going to be in Dade County. And then you go into downtown Miami, Sunny Isles, Miami Beach like that. You got rentals. rentals. Rentals are inching up to about four months of supply. We typically say down here, six months is equilibrium. So when you start to look at the data, you can see uh, the trajectory wasn't good. There was a short runway um, even before the COVID hit. And now it's a question of what the hell is going to go down. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about that? Because it's a whole chain of events. Like if you have oversupply in the rental market, 
uh, rental apartment market, that dribbles down to driving condo prices down. So what's kind of the chain of events there? Okay, let me walk you through it. And um, I'm trying not to be too much inside baseball. I like to, I like to get into it. But here, here's the, these are the two most important things to keep in mind if you are a owner of a condo. Let's talk about that individual. That individual, basically, if they have a condo in downtown Miami, they're dropping about 75 cents a foot per month on their um, uh, maintenance fees. You know, the monthly fee you pay to keep the association humming and the amenities, which you can't use anymore. They're probably, if it's a $500,000 condo, you're probably in for another 83 cents a foot or so um, per month on property taxes about a $500,000 condo. So before you know it, you're in for, you know, let's call it a buck 60, buck 65 a foot to carry it. You put any debt on it, uh, you're looking at who knows what. What are rents going at? Today, about 260 a foot on a median basis, but that's what is in the multiple listing service, okay? The problem is we have a lot of, we have 10, roughly 10,000 new units built in downtown Miami, for instance, that are controlled by REITs. REITs are trying to populate their units and what they're doing is they're cutting deals. Nobody knows what the deals are because they're not hiring realtors to list them and put them in the MLS. So the shadow inventory is all the REIT product and we don't know what the deals are. You know, it's been, there's been signs where they're giving you two, three months of free rent out there uh, basically to move into one of their properties. Now, why is rent so important? Because most buyers will not buy a unit to live in it. Their plan is to rent it out. And if you buy a unit and you can't rent it and you can't cover your carry, what do you do? You look at selling it because you don't want to subsidize someone. And what does that mean? That adds to the oversupply. This is how it always goes down since I've been here in an uh, in the 90s, early 90s. So not, nothing's really different from that regard. It's always driven by rent. Right. So essentially, a lot of rental apartments get built, REITs are renting them out for lower prices. The individual condo owner still has to rent out their apartment, but they're not covering their mortgage by doing it. And therefore, they're going to sell because they don't want to be carrying something where they're losing every yep. month and can't find a renter to, to, to rent. Now, now, some of your audience members are going to say, whoa, 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 Peter, you know, you're blowing out of proportion. Miami Beach, everybody wants to live in Miami Beach. Miami Beach is just spectacular. Well, what you need to keep in mind in Miami Beach is that your maintenance fee, that monthly fee for the association, you're looking at about a buck a foot there. And the difference is when you go on the barrier island where Miami Beach is, it's about four to five miles separated by a causeway um, down here in South Florida. So Miami Beach, a um, dollar a foot on the maintenance fees. The problem is the units are massive unless you go into some shitty old Art Deco that was built, you know, hundred years ago, but nobody wants to live there because you got jealousy windows and it doesn't have any creature comforts. So what happens is they go to go into a, a condo. Condos are massive and you can't get any efficiency. So you own a big unit with a high carry and you can't get the rent because everybody's going into downtown Miami. So, so even Miami Beach is not isolated, which some of your audience will, will argue with me about. But that's, right. that's, what I, that's my point. Yeah, I want to get into specific neighborhoods, but I already have a little pushback on the Q&A here. Nice. Keep so it, much. bring it on. <laughs> is bring Peter, it on. Is Peter shorting the market with his words and buying on the other side when the market comes down? So Great question. Yeah. Um, I, I would recommend uh, two people to go back and look at my column that I wrote in April of 2016 for The Real Deal. And in it, I talked about what was sort of coming down the pike. And then lo and behold, those of you who don't like me, I disappeared for four years. So I was in my self-imposed quiet period. So talking down the market, no, 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 no. I'm bringing some reality. Many of you have been talking up the market. You're talking about how Miami's a great way to Latin America and this and that. Well, the day of reckoning is coming and you got a bunch of people looking to take down stuff and they're not going to be nice and they're not going to pay you what you think is fair market value. They're going to pay you what the property is actually worth, which is basically replacement minus a percentage. Mm -hmm. So we talked a little bit beforehand about downtown Miami. Um, and we just got a question here. What percentage okay. do you see condo prices dropping and in what time frame? So in the context of you were talking about downtown Miami being a $300, 350 a square foot market, can you kind of address sure. those in that context? So, so again, this is a little bit of a different scenario than we had last time because of the COVID, what I call the COVID, but the oversupply is, and it always sort of plays out. Generally speaking, downtown Miami, if you look at the, the over the past or the last two cycles, going back to 03, it's going to blend out about 375 a foot. 375 is really the going price. What's replacement cost? Every developer will tell you something different. I don't know, ballpark at 300 bucks a foot or so. So basically, the sweet spot is under 375 and preferably under 300 a foot. Developer early stages, they're looking at 50% 
profit margin. That's what they're going in. They have cost overruns. They have a variety of different things, which is why they're trying to get 600 a foot off people. So generally speaking, it's a 375 a foot market. That's what's bared fruit. If you bought previous cycle, if you would have bought no six, you would have paid about 375, 380 a foot. And lo and behold, the properties fell as they started to come back when we began this cycle. Many people thought, okay, now it's my time to cash out. Unfortunately, what happened is developers put up new product. When they put up new product, those people actually in downtown Miami, they never got back to where they were when they originally purchased it in 06, but they were 10 years later and mm. special assessments coming down the pike. And you're also talking about some outliers in the downtown Miami market too, right? You know, the Star Architects buildings and those are yeah. like a thousand dollars a square foot. So you think that those might be a little bit more exposed? Yeah, you know, if, if I would put out a hit list and I don't have, I'm not doing any consulting for any of these firms and uh, I'm not, we're not taking positions any of these firms. What I would tell you is theoretically or generally speaking, what I would call the mothership, the larger inefficient units, the beach houses, if you will, those are located on the barrier island because people dream of coming down here. They want to wake up and look at the sand and they want to run on the sand or so they tell themselves. So they're bigger units and they're not necessarily efficient from a rental perspective, although Airbnb potentially could be. In downtown Miami, they tend to be micro units, very tight, small units, high density, you know, who gives a shit about parking type of scenario. Let's just build as many as we can because we want to build up our tax revenue, city of Miami perspective. So lo and behold, this cycle, we've had some developers try again to build something that is more appropriate for the barrier, barrier island. And I'll say it, Echo Brickle, 1000 Museum. They built product that's more suitable for the barrier island. They charge north of a thousand a foot. This stuff will not rent out. The people trying to sell it can't uh, effectively get the price they want. It don't necessarily believe the price that you see uh, recorded in terms of at the end of the day, it was recorded at this price. We all know there's a lot of kickbacks. There's a lot of incentives. There's other stuff going on. So basically what I'm telling you is luxury. These high-end massive units, which are inefficient, the ones designed by Starkitects, those are the ones that have the greatest risk. And as the big boys go down, then lo and behold, it has an effect, the downward pressure on the smaller ones. That would be my, my argument, my thesis. And you don't think because those are special buildings or, you know, one of a kind that they would therefore hold value better? Well, I think those units in theory would hold better, but l let me give a, go back to a scenario that happened last go around. Mm -hmm. So last go around, you had Sunny Isles Beach. It was just sort of blowing up. So the Rockstar building last go around, Sunny Isles Beach was a building called Jade Ocean. Jade Ocean was all glass. It was pushing a thousand a foot. Next door to it, you had Jade Beach. Jade Beach was more of a traditional building. Both oceanfront buildings doing what they're doing. Jade Ocean had a star architect, Jade Beach not necessarily. So lo and behold, market goes forward, market collapses. At the end of the day, the product was trading roughly about 10% difference in price. So even though the pre-construction was built up being one thing, at the end of the day, what people realize is a condo is a commodity. Once you get past the hoopla, the beautiful people, the free booze, and all this excitement about what's going to happen, it's effectively a commodity. It's no different than oil, no different than orange juice, no different than pork bellies. It's the same thing. People buy based on a price per foot. And what you have inside in terms of your beautiful marble and granite, nobody gives two shits because at the end of the day, they're going to buy it. They're going to look, make their money, and they're going to move on because no one's thinking about setting up a family of four and living the American dream here. Uh, what they're doing is they're coming in for a short period of time, which is why global sea level is never really an issue for most investors in South Florida. Mm -hmm. I want to touch on some other neighborhoods, but I have some questions okay. here about how many rental units are coming on the market the next six to 12 months. And also, you know, what's the market price for rentals, uh, you know, ballpark in downtown Miami, Miami Beach right now? What's been the, the trend in the rental market recently that you've seen? Okay. Okay, so let me just put out there for uh, perspective. Um, nobody knows the rental numbers. Whoever tells you they know the numbers or rental numbers, they're basically bullshit. You know, they're blowing smoke up your ass. The reality is what a lot of people re rely on is the multiple listing service. Multiple listing service is a database of realtors. If you're a realtor and you're going to get paid a commission and you're going to pay a commission, you go ahead and you put in the MLS. So people use the MLS. That's what I use. You don't have the REITs the real estate investment trusts, which build their own units, they're not listing properties because they would have to pay 10% of gross annual uh, uh, rent in the form of a commission. They'd rather give somebody 40 grand to sit in the leasing office and get a part-timer. So, so effectively, rental data is bad. Do not believe it. If you're going to look at rental data, downtown Miami, I suggest you use median number only because it's simply right in the middle and it's, it's a guess, nothing more than that. It's coming in about 260 a foot, roughly. Uh, 10 years ago in 09, at the bottom of our last cycle, you're looking at about a buck fifty a foot, just to give you context. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how about the supply? Do you have a sense of that, even though that's hard to gauge as well? Supply in downtown Miami, again, according to MLS, is roughly somewhere in the ballpark of about three months or so. 
three mm-hmm. months. But 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 let, let me tell you something anecdotal. Um, anecdotally, when we were humming down here and rentals were just going up and everybody was flocking and they were flee they were flocking downtown Miami and fleeing South Beach. You had to get on a waiting list at some of the developer buildings in order to get into a rental. Today, they are openly marketing these projects, and more importantly, I'm actually seeing realtors who are getting hired to list rentals for a REIT, which is very unique and atypical, and they're sending out email blasts saying that they're actually going to pay a commission. They're going to, what they call, cooperate, and that was something you would not see if the market was strong. It's much like pre-construction. If you want to see how, how much a market's in trouble or a building's in trouble, look at commissions. When we began our cycle, real estate commission was 5% near the end, sitting at 10%, and most of it's prepaid because they can't move the product. Right, right. How about that, you know, counter argument to the stability of developments and new construction in general, you know, I want to get back to neighborhoods, but you yep. know, that the buyers are putting down 50% deposits and that changes the equation this time around. And it's just, um, you know, besides Miami, you know, having more star architecture and more cultural stuff going on and maybe more baby boomers heading down there and less regulation in the Northeast, like it wasn't that supposed to be the thing that really helps this time around? Yeah, so, so la- let's go around. The ones who took it on the chin were the developers, those who weren't able to get out of their products, you know, the George Perez's of the world who couldn't unload Icon Brickle, so he had to get the keys back, as well as the lenders, the lenders who put the cash on the table and they had to take haircuts in order to dump product. So that's who got hit last time. These people learned and they have battle scars, so they were able to avoid it. So what happened this time? 50% deposits. The ones who are going to take the hit this time is going to be the out-of-towner who bought these units. They bought two, three. They believed in a dream. They thought they were going to buy and they were going to flip and they were going to get out. They're going to be the ones who basically get sacrificed. So what that means is if you are a hedge fund manager and you're sitting up there in Connecticut and you're thinking, okay, I'm going to go down there. I'm going to flock down. I'm going to take it down. Unfortunately, many of the units have closed. What we're finding from our stats, 10 to 15% of a building is unsold developer has it, they'll move it out in blocks, but it's not the 50 to 60% many of you want because you want to control the association. So really what this is about, this is about that small time investor who wants to build a portfolio slowly and begrudgingly and ultimately put it together. There's a lot of deals on the street and we're already seeing discounts in terms of transactions. Yeah, I call it 30% or so a new product, but it tends to be bigger and it tends to be way overpriced. Mm-hmm. 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 And you talked about out of towners coming in, you know, yep. from Miami Beach, always coming in from out of town, you have a different perception of it than, than locals do. You know, we had a question on here too about just the high-end market in Miami Beach and just kind of what you see see down the road there, which we, we talked about a little earlier. You know. well, well, Stuart, Stuart, if I can add something to that. Uh, yeah. I was talking to a good buddy of mine. Um, uh, I did a podcast with him a couple of weeks ago. He's, he's a lender. He puts out private money and he also does traditional mortgages. What he was saying is the, the, the jumbo mortgage market is basically done. They turned off the spigot because it's not backed by the feds. It's portfolioed for the most part. So basically, if you're north of, let's call it, I think it's 515, 550, say north of $600,000 $600, in terms of a loan, you can't get a loan. So what do you do if you're a luxury buyer who paid 1500 bucks a foot you got a four thousand square foot place you're looking to resell it and the guy or the woman buying it wants to put leverage on it they want to put finance on it they can't get their hands on a loan and if they do it's very expensive so while while you if you have a listing on a luxury unit you might think it's a rock star unit and it's over the top and it's you know all the usual blah 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 the reality is that buyer coming in is not going to want to go all cash unless they get a significant discount so what do you do then you basically die on the vine and eventually, you know, you say uncle and you give it up for less than you want. Or you as listing agent, you don't make any money. You got a six month listing and you're basically driving back and forth and not making any money off of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, some of the condo market. How about like in the single family market? We're getting some questions about that now. Do you think it's going to be a different proposition? So I, in our, my organization, we focus primarily on condos, but let me give you some context about single family. So in our world, there's two worlds. There's East and 95, which we call a trading pit. Like back in the day before high frequency trading, everybody got in there and they were just trading stuff. And then you got West and 95. These are real people. How much is diaper? How much do diapers cost? How much does milk cost? They're real people, real jobs, really affected, not traders, if you will. So what I would tell you is a lot of people who live West in horizontal, uh, situations, a house, if you will, they make their money east in a tower. They're selling title. They're selling furniture. They're laying tile. They're doing whatever you're doing. So as this condo market goes sideways, I mean, realtors, hell, realtors, as this market goes sideways, those who are living horizontal, they start to get jammed up. So so while it seems like it's only condo related initially, you in a single family house where you're homesteaded, ask yourself, where am I getting my cash from? And where's my boss who's paying me? Where are they making their money? And am I going to get hit by this? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
That makes sense. And going back to Miami a little bit more, less single family, but what do you see happening a little bit more commercial related with Wynwood and some people asked about Edgewater. Um, what do you, what do you see for the future there? Well, well, listen, somebody asked if I was shorting Miami Beach or South Beach. Listen, if I could short, I'd short the shit out of Wynwood. Wynwood back in 09, we were taking a look at what today they call the synergy. Uh, we were trying to buy the note back in the day. I think we priced it about 40 bucks a foot. 40 bucks a foot. Bank, I think, got rid of it 80 bucks a foot or so. I don't know what's recorded, but that's basically what was going on, special asset side. Lo and behold, fast forward, I was doing one of my walking tours uh, last year, and and somebody had a unit on the market for 750 a foot. So in 10 years, we went from, let's call it traditionally 200 a foot, to somebody trying to get north of 700 a foot. It, it's a market that was completely blew up. Why? Because it was hop, it was hip, it was cool. Everybody was driving a Maserati. They had the nice wash, the Apple Watch doing all all this type of stuff. Well, the day of reckoning is coming. So on the Winwood side, take a look, ask yourself how many locals are still in it and how many of them have dumped to, to supposedly smarter out-of-towners and where have they put the money? They put it in the next hustle, which is Alapata, Little Haiti, or increasingly Little Havana. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How does Edgewater compare? That's a different, obviously, market. Yeah, you know, um, I, I might offend some uh, with this, and you know, I, I tend to do that. Generally speaking, look at the lo- look at look at Greater Downtown Miami. And we define it as the Rickenbacker Causeway, which is like 26 Street South, up to the Julia Tuttle, which is 36 North, 95 East of Biscayne Bay. So we, did, we, we sort of define that as greater downtown Miami. I will tell you, look at this market as if it were a law firm. And what happens is when you start off as an admin assistant, you live in Edgewater. When you aspire to become a managing partner, up and coming partner, a rock star on the rise, you're living in downtown Miami, which is the MacArthur to the river. And then when you've reached it, you've gone ahead and you hit Brickle. That's the way it works. Now, now, if you go on Brickle today, you will pay the same price as Edgewater. The difference is Brickle, you can walk and no view. Edgewater, you get a view, but you'll get shivved as you're walking around the neighborhood. So that's the trade-off. But at the end of the day, developers are very smart to, and, and brokerages are very smart. They know how to price it. It's the same price. It's like the Big Mac index that The Economist runs. Yeah, I think we might get some, you might get some uh, mail on that one. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but anybody who's down here, yeah. tell me that I'm wrong. Tell me, tell me that I'm wrong. And trust me, I do a lot of walking in and around the neighborhood. So let's talk a little bit about like, you know, we talked about different areas. Um, you mentioned that distressed investors, you know, aren't necessarily banging down your door yet. Um, you know, maybe also people are sheltering in place, obviously. Um, but like, what are the kind of possible plays when there's, you know, a, a downturn? You know, is it, is it bulk condo purchases primarily? Is it buying up loans? Is it land deals? you know, all the above, what, what do you see as some of the, the, you know, plays that happen first? Sure, sure, sure. So, so, so um, when COVID first started hitting and the lockdowns were coming down, I started getting a bunch of calls from New York and Connecticut. These are fund managers or, or, or what I call scouts trying to figure out what the hell is going on. My, my response to them is, listen, take April off. Nothing is going to happen. We won't have any sense of anything until May. So I would anticipate as I start to lift these, um, you know, these stay at home orders and things like that, people will start to get serious. So there's a lot of, um, um, I don't know, evaluation and thought going into kind of what's going on now. We would anticipate as we start to get into the summer and as product uh, doesn't really sell, uh, for whatever reason, maybe people were afraid they don't actually want to walk into one of these units because they're afraid they're going to catch it. Maybe a seller doesn't want somebody in their unit. Maybe virtual tours just don't sort of cut it. As that stuff sort of sits on the market, um, it tends to inspire people to sort of make things happen. So I'm not concerned whatsoever right now in terms of uh, the fact that everybody's sort of laying low. Mm-hmm. In terms of um, uh, uh, which, which, what groups kind of want to get involved and what sort of sectors, we only really do condos. Uh, mm-hmm. Single family, maybe we'll dabble into, but not really. Um, what mm-hmm. I'm hearing for some of my buddies on the office side is they're worried. This whole Zoom phenomenon. I mean, mm-hmm. this is my first time using it. The whole Zoom phenomenon. How many companies are going to say, what the hell do we have all this office space for? Mm-hmm. Why don't we just have some people telecommuting and makes their quality of life better? We don't have to give them a raise. In mm-hmm. fact, we might have to cut their money because of what's going on with the economy. And we can, uh, assuming you can get out of it, we can get out of it at least. So I would be shorting the office market. I'd be going long on the warehouse market. Why? Mm-hmm. Because I think we're all seeing that the Amazon effect in terms of delivery is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. Anywhere. Uh, retail market, I was short the shit out of. Who's going to go sit into a restaurant if, and who's going to open a restaurant if you can have 25 to 50 percent of your seating seats uh, occupied? And if you do go to eat there, do you want to wear a mouth uh, or a guard face guard in order to? So there's a lot of things that just don't work. Um, condo side, uh, you know, the arguments made. People have to live somewhere. They have to live somewhere, and I agree. 
and sellers have to sell and, and landlords need to go. But the key is price. The right price, everything trades. Mm -hmm. Wrong price, it sits on the market. Yeah. Do you see, you were mentioning on the phone earlier that you don't think bulk condo purchases will necessarily be, you know, where people will go first. Buying up loans will be more, more the activity you'll see first. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's not really a, a bulk play, if you will. Not, not like back in the day. Back in the day, we were chasing buildings like um, what today they call the Visca uh, Viscane, they call it. Mm -hmm. You know, two buildings was called the Everglades. It had 849 units. We were chasing 750, 800 units of it. Those days are not here. What you got now is you got a block of units here and there, 10, 15%. So it's not enough to get Wall Street to write its $25 million check minimum. It'll probably be 2 million, 3 million, something like that. Just because there's not enough blocks of inventory that are big no. enough? No, yeah. there's not enough blocks of inventory. So what you have to do is you almost have to go ahead and build a portfolio by going to this person who's got four units and mm -hmm. this other person bought three units and then the brother-in-law has five units. And that way you slowly can put it together. So it doesn't work for Wall Street because they can't come in and, and receive, or reach what they want, which a lot of them call tonnage. So the right. tonnage is not there. The bandwidth is not there. But what it does is it creates opportunity for the local, the local who understands the market to go in there and really sort of slice and dice if mm -hmm. you can truly evaluate the market and understand it. Right. We had a question come in a couple of minutes ago. What advice would you have for younger investors looking to take advantage of current conditions? So that seems like that would be a play that would, would make sense, right? Uh, what I would say to a younger investor is first and foremost, uh, look very skeptical, skeptically at all the information that's out there. Last go around, last cycle, and I'm not going to tell you to walk uphill. I had to walk uphill with, you know, against the wind and the snow four miles to get to school. None of that type of story. But last cycle, you had news organizations that were out there that were putting out good information. You had multiple reporters covering real estate at various publications. Take a look at the state of where journalism is today. And why do I say that? I Say that because there's nobody uh, watching the, the 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 hen house, and as a result of that, that's why the real deal is flourishing and will continue to flourish, and that's why you guys are getting your forty cents a day. But the reality is, there's a lot of bad intel out there. So what I would suggest to you is, if you are a new to this market investor, do your own research. Get into government records. The state of Florida has great sunshine laws. You can pull up anything and everything on everyone. Go in there, roll up the sleeves. If you're serious about doing it, spend the time. Real estate is not about going to networking events and talking. To telling everybody how great they are and worrying about what, what clothing and purse you might have. It's about actually going in there, hitting the trenches and making it happen. So that would be my suggestion. Look at the real deal. Look at other publications where it's, it's real sort of hard hitting news coming out. Look at lawsuits. Lawsuits are great. You know, I, I, Stuart, I think you saw the feds just busted a $450 million uh, 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 fraud uh, ring with Venezuela with properties in South Florida. Well, listen, if you're a new investor, what you do is you go, you pull the indictment, you see where the properties are located, you see what the units are, and then you know that the feds are going to auction those units off to go towards paying everything else. That's a perfect way to pick up uh, business. So that's what I would tell you to do. Roll up the sleeves, use this time to actually do hard work. It's not about networking. It's about knowing what you're talking about is what I would encourage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and if you really want help, uh, give my brokerage a call and somebody here will help you. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's my plug. It's a bigger play, but loans, we talked about loans a little bit. Yep. Um, you know, you, you think you'll see a difference between local lenders and some of the out of town lenders. What do you think is going to be if there's, if there is a disposition of assets there or they're trying to get loans off their books? Yeah. I look like. Yeah, I, I think the loan play will probably be um, pretty predictable. Generally speaking, what will happen, you'll have your out-of-town organizations that have come down here. Uh, they fell in love with South Florida. They fell in love with all the usual type of stuff. Plus, they want an excuse to come down here and visit uh, You know, all the properties in their portfolio. What you'll probably see is as the auditors or the underwriters or anybody else starts to go through it, uh, they'll start to write off stuff. They'll start to sell it below par. Uh, those discounts will typically move to larger organizations. The local people will hit the local banks. The local people will go in and they'll try to hit the, uh, you know, the bank on the street that has four branches and a billion dollars in assets, if you will. And, and what you'll find there is that there'll be legitimate business going on. It'll be negotiable. Neither party is really going to get hung out to dry. So I would tell you, if you're looking for a deal and you're looking to pay fair market value, slightly below, go to a local bank. If you are looking to basically uh, scalp, scalp someone, you probably want to go to a larger bank, but understand you're going to be going up against the ST residentials of the world or whatever they're going to be called this time around. So uh, Wall Street does what Wall, deals with Wall Street while the locals will deal with locals. So that would be my recommendation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And one other sector of investment, land. What do you think is going to happen with land in the coming years? And, you know, is it, can you even talk about new developments getting built, you know, three or four? two or three years down the line or 
Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so during the previous cycle, which was 03 to 10, what we did is we, we used data to figure out what, how, where the buildings were, what were, how many units were in a building, what, what's sold. So what I'm, and what I'm doing is I'm telling you there's a long way uh, that we modeled the market and it took a lot of time. This cycle, we began in 11, we put a nice name on it, we call it Crane Spotters. Mm -hmm. Crane Spotters is effectively a hit list database. So we tracked any and every project that was announced, what was actually built, and then what was entitled, what was put out there for market. So mm -hmm. there's a running list out there on Crane Spotters where you can basically see every property that was announced at some point. Those are the ones that I would encourage you to take a look at if you are an investor. Now, what typically is gonna happen on price? I would venture to guess land's gonna have virtually no value during the downturn, depending on how long this lasts. Last time we saw land trading, at 10 to 20 cents on the dollar and you say well peter that's that's bullshit you know if it's that's the case I'll, I'll buy it i'll sit on it well the problem is you're gonna buy it you're gonna pay property taxes on it you can't do anything with it and there's only so many windwood yards and there's only so many wharfs you can open up where you basically bring in some roach coaches or food trucks and you and you sell some beer where you can actually try to get some rental income going otherwise you don't make money on this land so it just sits on the market and sits on the market until eventually somebody comes by they buy cheap i Ideally, they buy with entitlements, and then when the market turns, they're the first ones out of the chute looking to build and take advantage of the cheap land costs. I mean, the first tower to go up this cycle in South Florida, it was put up on 23 and um, 23rd Street and effectively Biscayne Boulevard, a project called 23 Biscayne Bay. That property was bought um, uh, by the Mellow Group with land that they actually acquired as part of a distress play from, I think the lender was Bank of America or Wells Fargo or something. The reason they were able to go forward in 11 and announce a brand new project when everybody else thought there would be no new construction is because they stole the dirt. And if you steal the dirt, lo and behold, the rest of it falls into place pretty easily. Right. You just come in with a low cost basis and everything else. Makes you got sense. it. Yeah. Yep. You got it. One other factor in this is, you know, foreclosures and, you know, once the freeze ends, like we were talking about that a little bit, do you think there's going to be that have a, will have a massive impact later on all at once? Well, so um, I, I don't do mortgages. I'm not a mortgage broker. I don't do anything like that. Many of my investors I deal with are um, uh, uh cash buyers. Uh, some of them do the, their mortgages. They do a variety of different things. But generally speaking, you're talking to some banking people. Let's say people in the banking sector. What they're telling me is, is effectively, you get a six-month moratorium if it's a, a government-backed loan. Six-month moratorium, uh, uh, effectively a forbearance. I don't pay my mortgage for six months. At the end of, or in and around the end of six months, and this is after you've notified your, your lender you're not going to be paying, at the end of six months, you can then file for an extension, which will give you another six months. So what, they're, what the bank are telling me, and again, this isn't what I do, and I'm not an attorney, check with your legal counsel, but generally speaking, what they're saying is unless there's some kind of move by the, le the government, the Congress, in order to provide some sort of backstop where suddenly it's guaranteed that forbearance will be rolled into the back end, the banks are going to be taking steps to try to be locked and loaded. So on day 366, they're going to be that, that um, uh, 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 sniper in the bell tower looking to take you out. So that's what some people are worried about, and that's why you're hearing all this talk where, you know, what if I don't pay my mortgage? What if I do, don't do this? What if I, do? and, and again, it's not my specialty, but that's the word on the street right now. And right now, who knows what the facts are because you know, the market's changing daily. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to talk about some of the past downturns you've seen, but first of all, I want to ask too, like, you know, I mean, you can make the argument things are a lot worse in New York right now. Right. And, you know, not only with, you know, um, coronavirus, but also reg rent regulation and red tape. And there are a lot of developers that want to come down to South Florida a lot of baby boomers and stuff. Do you factor that into the kind of calculations of there being, you know, distressed market? How do you kind of weigh that against everything else? Yeah. So generally speaking, this is the way it works. So somebody will come down to South Florida and they say, oh my God, I love South Florida. I want to live here. I, I, I earned it. I deserve this. So the first place they start is South Beach, South of Fifth. So they go to South Beach, South of Fifth and they say, this is where I want to be. I want to put my money in it. It's going to be fantastic. It's going to be great. Then they start to look at pricing and they say, eh, maybe South Beach doesn't necessarily cut it. Let me check Middle Beach. Eh, let me look at downtown Miami. So what happens is depending on what they want to burn or what they want to spend and where they are on their level of life, their stage of life, whether they're chasing vanity or whether they're looking for a place where they can, they can keep their heads above water, they'll tend to go north. So condo pricing in Florida begins in South Beach, south of Fifth, and as you go north, prices simply go down. And if you're really looking to save money, then you go to the west coast of Florida. So that's typically how it goes. Now what's happened is greater downtown Miami has become a bigger and bigger destination for people and for places, and why is that? That's because the urbanization effect of it. Before you used to have to drive, what people loved about South Beach is you could walk while in downtown Miami you had to drive everywhere. Now suddenly we can walk. So we're actually seeing the market 
market expand. And as it expands, I think you're going to see more people giving up that idea of living like in the Seinfeld TV program, living in Del Boca Vista, <laughs> where in, in a horizontal place where there's a gated community and everybody goes to the golf course and stuff like that. And many of them are opting for, okay, let me get myself a place in an urban environment. I got Uber. I mm-hmm. have Instacart. I have everything else. And I can actually live my same lifestyle as New York or anywhere else. But now I'm living in the tropics. So I can really sort of see that being a demographic shift that, that starts to occur. And now with everything going on with public transportation, at least down here in Miami, it's, there's no way in hell is in New York, but we're making progress. Mm-hmm. So suddenly, you know, that golf course house, house on a golf course in, in uh, Del Boca Vista, that's no longer what people want. Now they want to live in a condo tower. They want a view of the water and they want all the creature comforts. And I think that's what we'll see as we go forward. Mm-hmm. So that's a potential bright spot in the market. And yep. what is that? portend to what is that like you know what how do, what are the real estate implications of that i guess right well i more micro units more smaller units yeah so i you know i think one of the things that the great recession taught us if you read some of the stuff or you talk to people it's all anecdotal um what do we really need how much space do we really need is it really that paramount is that important and what is it what is this covid uh situation going to do especially if it's long and uh, uh prolonged what if it is great depression era unemployment things like that mm-hmm. people are going to go with less and as they go with less those rock star places that were rock star during the run-up they suddenly seem so uh obsolete they're 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 they you know they don't work anymore where the good solid meat and potatoes is always going to be there so what's the ideal place Buy yourself a one bed with 700 square feet. Buy yourself a two bed, no more than 1,000 square feet. Why? Because if you don't want to live there, you can rent it. You can cover your costs for the most part, and you're not going to lose it. If you splurge and you got to have the best unit in the best building, chances are you're going to get hung out to dry, and a guy like me is going to knock on your door, and we're going to take you out. So that would be my words of advice, especially for some of the older people who are looking down here. And if you're a millennial, you want to buy your first place, this is a time to get serious. Get in there. Take a run at product. Why? Because you're going to get an opportunity. There will be people cutting bait. And as these people cut bait, you're going to have an opportunity to take stuff down at prices that, you know, you, you probably won't see again for another 10 years because this is what we do. Yeah. How far this is obviously a billion dollar question, but how far do you think prices could fall? Well, we're pricing everything. So, so I, I, I have an arrangement. I'm, I'm working with a private equity group called Brickle Ventures. And we, we, uh, we, have an, we, we have a perspective in terms of what we've been chasing. At. We've made deals and offers and stuff like that. Basically, we won't look at it unless it's 300 bucks a foot. What's 300 bucks a foot? It's effectively replacement cost. What's the sweet spot? 250 a foot. You get us very, very, very interested. South of 250 a foot, we really want it. Now, some people who are out there are going to say, this guy is smoking something. It's legal in Florida, but it's not fully legal. And no, I'm not smoking anything. What is that based on? That's based on the fact that condos are simply commodities. They're nothing special. You can have a nice big name on it. But what was taught to us last go around? Well, you can get a bankruptcy court to sign an order. And lo and behold, that's big special name you have on it can disappear overnight and they can revert back to some generic type of name. So what I'm telling you is understand what you have in a condo. It's a place and it's all about numbers. Run the numbers. You want to know how much it costs. What is it worth? Things like that. Don't get carried away. Now, some units might be unique, but generally speaking, a condo is not unique. And as a result of that, deals are out there and deals will be out there. And the beautiful thing about condos, unlike a a neighborhood with houses, a number of houses have to trade for the prices to get recalibrated. In a condo, it only takes a few. And all of a sudden, everything gets recalibrated and the appraiser coming in, if you want to get a mortgage, now they're scratching their head because they can't make the numbers work. So, so once the downward spiral begins, it just goes on and on and on. But, but I do want to say, I am not uh, pessimistic. I'm very optimistic. I'm very optimistic. And, you know, I mean, even before everything happened with the coronavirus, there was, you know, softness in the Miami luxury market, right? But I wouldn't say it was anywhere comparable. It was a a down market, but it wasn't anywhere comparable to what happened in 2009. So, I mean, I think there is the fact that Miami is a little bit more resilient or a little bit more of a global city. But can you kind of talk about how, you know, what you think coming up might compare to 2009 and, you know, or 2007, 2008 and, and, you know, for those who weren't in the market at that time, yep. what, what was what was 2007, 2008 like? Well, and, and Stuart, you know, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, one of the big differences this time is foreign nationals. Mm-hmm. Foreign nationals. If you're not, if you, who the hell in their right mind is going to go to a place where they don't feel welcome? You don't feel welcome. And it doesn't have anything to do with your politics. But if you don't feel welcome, are you going to come and lay down cash? Are you going to want to bring your family? 
a few times a year or you're going to want to, you know what I'm saying? So this is one of the factors we didn't have last time. So this is another reason, you know, and another aspect too, just to talk about pricing and stability. What about the feds? What about the money laundering crackdowns? What about these orders where suddenly you're buying all cash? Feds want to know who you are, who the ultimate end user is, and people are getting taken down. They're getting sent to prison. They're cutting deals. And as this goes on, if you're a money launderer, do you really want to come here? Why is a money launderer important? Because they're gonna they're going to inflate prices. So again, little things that are different this time that you didn't necessarily get uh, l- last time around. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if I answered your question or if you want me to. Yeah, no, I mean, at the depth of the last, you know, downturn you had, yep. you know, 400 unit buildings that had one light on and you had yep. squatters and high rise apartments. I mean, that was- Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That, that was great. That was great. So, yeah, so let, 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 let me give you a war story from last time. And let me tell you what I know about going on this time. So last time, war story, um, uh, realtors who couldn't effectively get, um, they couldn't get sales, but they were getting REOs, bank owned properties. They were actually squatting in units. They were living in the unit themselves. This was back in the day. If anybody goes into a condo in and around Brickell Avenue and they take your photograph and they ask you to fill out some form, that's because the associations got together with the city of Miami police. They put in place security because you had squatters going into buildings. You would walk into units and you see clothes laying on the side. You see this, you see that. I had an agent who was working with me at the time. He got approached by one of the uh, numerous porn companies down here about paying 1800 bucks for a one day shoot in, in, in one of the units. So there was a lot of funky, funky, funky stuff going on there. Um, uh, what else did we have last time? We had the cash for keys hustle. Cash for keys hustle as you go, you move into a place, whether you have a lease for it or you don't. Lo and behold, um, when the bank takes title to it, you get paid three to five grand to pack your stuff and leave. So we've seen the first sign of that down here. There was a report uh, last week on uh, one of the local news channels. Some woman was selling her place. She had it vacant. Realtor goes to show the property. There's somebody's living in there. They pull out the lease. They say, I live here. Landlord calls the cops as this person's trespassing. Cops say, if you don't leave this woman alone, we're going to have to arrest you, deal with, with the court. So we're already starting to see signs of that. So that, that, that's an interesting indicator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you were first, we talked about this at the the top of the show, but when you were first getting started, you were a banking reporter. Banking. What led you... I originally came down in 93. I was writing economic development for something called Miami Today, which is a Mm -hmm. weekly publication. Yep, yep. And what led you to leave reporting and start a company focused on distress? Like, why, why, why make that leap? Yeah, so, so back in 05 when I was doing the banking. So, so I worked at the South Florida Business Journal. I, I, I was an associate editor there. So I was like number three on the editorial side. I took a pay cut and a demotion. I went and I worked over at uh, Miami Daily Business Review because I wanted to write banking. Um, I knew banking was really sort of, that's what drives the market, even though no one knows uh, uh, who any bankers are for the most part, unless they're indicted or they name a street after them like Abel Holtz. That's an inside joke for anybody down in Miami. Abel Holtz is a guy who went to prison for uh, a variety of different federal crimes in the 80s, and we still have a street in downtown Miami named after him. So, so most people didn't know who bankers were, but I knew that the bankers were the, the people behind the scenes who were sort of making things sort of happen. So I took a pay cut. I took it the motion. I'm writing about banking. I do that story I told you about where I carried a hit list of all the lead lenders who would basically have it go sideways. And then as I was reporting out the story, uh, everyone I was talking to was telling me basically the local banks were getting out of the hustle. They were dumping it out of towners. And whenever you see signs of that down here, you know, to sort of run for the hills. So that's what led me to think, okay, let me set up a buy side brokerage using data to work with um, uh, buyers because who the hell wants a listing, which is kind of where we are today. Who wants a listing? Uh, theoretically, if you can't sell it and you have to drive 30 minutes, you have to pay a valet to go upstairs, show it. The person's there 10 minutes and then you never hear back from them. So see things change, things change, but some things are exactly Exactly the same. Yeah. And when you first got that start, what was the reaction from the real estate industry? Oh, real estate industry absolutely hated me. And still to this day, some of our formers and currents uh, will tell you that they would call up and try to do a, um, try to show a property. And the industry was like, we don't like you. We're not going to show you. We're not going to do this. Not going to do that. Well, over the course of time, things course changed. Of time, things changed. And, 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 and the, I ended up getting brought on by the association. Uh, of realtors. I was on the corporate board uh, of realtors for a number of years. And um, yeah, I wouldn't say we're mainstream, but uh, you know, people sort of, they, they kind of put up with us kind of like taxes or parking tickets. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, but you'd be comfortable with being the bad boy and the flamethrower. Does that kind of harken back to your outlook as a journalist? Listen, you, uh, listen, a lot of these people who bitch and moan about me and they say this, they say that when they, when it's a <laughs> They, they actually have no problem with me. A lot of them say they like me. They just don't like the model. But what they don't realize is 
you need a buyer and a seller. You, 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 in order to have a market, you, you know, there's got to be two sides willing to take positions and you can't take it um, personal. You can't get be too sensitive and think, oh my God, that person disagrees with me. So they're an asshole. I'm never going to do uh, business with them. So we have evolved as a market. Now, I don't know if we wanted to, but ultimately we have, and there's going to be a lot more people who are out there looking to take advantage of what's coming. They just might uh, uh, have a nicer smile and they might give you a creative name, but trust me, they're all looking to basically steal what you got uh, dirt cheap. Right. And some of the people you mentioned that you've, you know, have spurned you for lunch have all, you've also done deals with. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Bulk deals. Bulk deals. So yeah. some, of the, some of the biggest developers around, uh, we've done bulk deals with. And, yeah. and publicly, yeah. they'll say I'm an asshole. Well, you know, and, and you mentioned maybe one day you're, you, you look to, to get into development yourself, right? Yeah, yeah. I, ideally, we get a good run here. We get to the next cycle. Um, like I said, I really train spotters, so I have a good sense of where all the um, entitled property is. I'd like to maybe build some micro units, ideally in and around public transportation, and the, and the real uh, effort would be Airbnb-oriented. I think if you can sell a condo to an individual, whether local or out of town or out of country, for roughly 200000 a door, and you can Airbnb it, and you can make a return, I think you can sell that all day long. People don't necessarily want all the amenities. They don't need to live on the water. They want a good, uh, a place that makes sense that can rent out. So I really think Airbnb or home sharing is the future. And hopefully, if we do have a dramatic downturn, the city of Miami Beach and other places will start to uh, call off the guard dogs and start to embrace Airbnb and home sharing because that's really the wave of the future. It reminds me of Broward County when they try to prohibit Uber. So what do people do? They simply took an Uber up to the Broward County line. They took a taxi a short distance, and then that was it. So there's always a way around. Around it. Ad- adopt and uh, understand that Airbnb is here to stay. And that's really the part that will get uh, this economy out of a downturn, I think, as you can travel around uh, once COVID has passed us. Yeah. Well, you probably won't be doing a lot of uh, traveling around the world in the next year or two, most likely. So, uh, yeah, well, I'm pretty, uh, pretty busy if, if uh, you know, the effects of this virus just r- remains. Um, I want to thank you, Peter. It was great to have you on board for today. And uh, yeah, just want to everybody out there. We have our Friday programming. Um, it's about New York City getting back to business with Kathy Wild, part of New York City. And, um, you know, for the tens of thousands of people who have already been watching Charity Live, I wanted to thank you. Subscribe to The Real Deal. As I mentioned, it's only 40 cents a day if you value what we do. And, uh, thanks again, Peter. Hey, sure, I'll see you soon. Hey, it was my pleasure. And, and just so everybody knows, when you're on the playing field, you play one way. When you're drinking a drink, you play another way. So, <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Ciao.